So this, uh, this talk will kind of take us a little further than Alessio's talk. Um, it'll go, he, at the end of his talk, he went in beyond E8 a little bit. So we'll explore that and uh, relate it to qubits in an indirect way. Uh, so we're going to go back to this. So it's Willer's it from bit upgraded to qubit revisited in the context of quantum gravity. Okay, so some of you have just come across the del peso services. And uh, so we're going to go into that. But first we'll review. So qubits, um, they can be considered as uh, elements of the space CP1. So you can think of a, a vector, which is um, a point um, here of CP1. And uh, algebraically, uh, through algebraic geometry, it's a degree one genus zero curve. Or you can think of it as a line in, in CP2, which is a projective plane. So that's kind of uh, the intuition that we'll carry along for the talk. And uh, as we know, the qubit is an upgrade on the classical bit. And uh, of course, quantum computation will utilize these things. But I'm not going to get too deep into the qubit structure, but I will be dealing with these curves, okay, with respect to gauge symmetries and uh, these unified approaches to uh, quantum gravity. Okay, so we'll review uh, del peso surfaces. So don't worry about all the details here, but I'm just covering the formal definition. Uh, so it's an algebraic surface uh, with log terminal singularities. I'll kind of explain what that is. Uh, and its anti-canonical divisor is ample. Okay, so this is a condition. It's an algebraic condition, and uh, we don't worry too much about the. There's there are curves in this surface that satisfy uh, some property, and that's what ample means. So a two-dimensional log terminal singularity, uh, or the, com the the complex field, is a singularity. Okay, which is analytically equivalent to a quotient singularity. So some of you might have encountered this, which is a a C2 with um, some kind of uh, a subgroup of GL2, uh, which some of you have, have seen it in the context of the McKay correspondence. So uh, some of these symmetry groups here will, will be symmetries of, uh, of the platonic solids. So you can look at them in, in terms of uh, an SL2 or an SU. Too, and you can have some finite subgroups. So this is definitely related to the McKay correspondence, and uh, that's what's so interesting about it. Okay, so going back to the 1800s, 1849, so you have Cayley, this is the same Cayley, um, associated with octonians, and uh, someone uh, discovered 27 lines on a non-singular uh, cubic surface. Okay, so 27, we've seen that come up before, but this is, it's definitely related to the 27 uh, that we've seen with uh, Jordan algebras. Okay, so now in modern times, okay, it's known that these are called exceptional curves, okay, on uh, del peso services, non singular, of degree three, where the, the degree is given by this um, relation here. So uh, these exceptional curves, so you can think the, the del peso surface, uh, you can pick a point. And instead of the point, you can, you, can blow up, you can blow up the point into like its own sphere. So when you have these blow ups, uh, they give you these exceptional curves. And this is giving you kind of a, a configuration of three of them. Okay, so. This is when you blow up the singularities? Yes, okay. yeah. So it's, it's kind of like you're trading the point for like uh, the space of lines through it. So it looks like a sphere, which looks like a cubic, the cubit space, okay. So it's nice, so you can look at it uh, in terms of a bunch of qubit spaces or just a pure um, algebraic geometry here. So, Okay, so uh, Schout noted in uh, an incidence of preserved bijection between this, the 27 lines on a smooth cubic and the vertices of a polytope that many of you have played with here. Uh, it's the 221 polytope in six dimensions. Okay, so it's the it's the, poly, the polytope, you know, acted on by the, uh, uh, by the vial, the vial uh, group for E6. Is it, 
it's, it's this one. Is it the root vector polytope of E6? It's, 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 another, it's another one. It's the one that's, uh, that's kind of dual to it. And uh, so it, it's this one, but the root one is, is the... Is, yeah, it's like the, the, yeah, the other one there. So this is, you can map um, these 27 lines in this cubic surface, right? You have this algebraic result where you're counting lines. And you can map these lines to vertices of this. So you can look at both. It gives you the power of looking at both of them. So, I mean, this is, th these are old results, but these are needed, of course, when you're going from one language to the other. Okay, so Coxeter and Duval showed a correspondence okay, between the, uh, the minus one curves on del peso surfaces of degree two and one and reflection polytopes for uh, the vowel groups for E7 and E8. So now there's these del peso surfaces that have these, these curves in it that are essentially spheres. They're lines, but they're really spheres. And uh, there's a correspondence between uh, those and the polytopes associated with E7 and E8. And many of you have already played with these uh, computationally. So this is, this is bringing us more into the modern language here, but you know, these are still old results. And uh, of course we have one of the polytopes here. Okay, so del peso surfaces, they're, they're different types. Okay, so mainly the ones that are coming up um, re in relation to quantum gravity. Uh, they're of this type here. Uh, so if they're uh, log del peso surfaces of index one, and they're known as the uh, Gornstein uh, log del peso uh, of degree D. So they have different degrees. Okay, so as you see, the D goes between one and nine. So it, you can't just keep growing uh, the D indefinitely. And uh, so when it's the degree is nine, it's essentially the surface is uh, the complex projective plane, CP2. And then if it's eight, uh, then you either have CP1 cross CP1, or you have this plane, blown, you have a point that's blown up to a sphere. So it's like the plane you have to blow up. And for all the other degrees, uh, you know, one through seven, you essentially, you blow up more points. You pick another point, you blow it up, and there's a condition on them where they're uh, independent points. When we say spheres, you, you mean two spheres, right? Two Not spheres, yep. Yeah, just two spheres, in, you know, which you can think of them as a, as a qubit space, too, mm -hmm. the CP1. So they look like, like these, but they're, um, they're contained in, you know, in, the, in the surface. So there's another correspondence as well. So, so I'm sorry, is that, are you saying sequential blow-ups? Yeah, you can. You can blow up you the Yeah, so the 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 first three are the easiest. The the other ones are a little trickier, yeah. But the first three, um, you can you can find these, you know, CP two is spanned by these uh, three independent points and these are, these would be a that'd be the easiest way to start. Well the number of blow ups it takes to resolve it. Um, I mean the it yeah it changes the the symmetry changes you have a different singularity there's a as you start blowing up um, you actually en enhance the symmetry so you go through the E series actually it's the so, and and you max out at E eight so it's kind of interesting and then so you're resolving the singularity but you're getting enhanced symmetry so. Okay, so the classification, uh, so these surfaces have, uh, they have an index, okay, so a certain index related to them. And uh, when you're studying, uh, you know, two or less, then you can actually study them with respect to another type of surface called K3 surfaces, which are also pretty hot um, in uh, string theory uh, compactifications, M-theory compactifications. But uh, mathematicians, they go, uh, they'll, they'll, They'll take it over to the K3 surface side, find some results, and then reduce it down to the del peso. So it's a, it's a nice um, way to go back and forth. So more recently, you know, uh, when you get to index three, it's kind of 
there's still more to be studied. You know, these things aren't completely classified yet. But the ones that are mainly studied in quantum gravity are of this type right there. Okay, so as far as the k equal 3, there's some interesting um, results, uh, such as, uh, I'll, I'll bring it up here. Uh, so if we let g, so it's, it's some finite subgroup here, uh, and it has index 3 here. Okay, so this is, this is what it means. And uh, one of them that I thought would be interesting or for you guys is uh, you can let g be a cyclic group, a cyclic group of this type here, um, of order n, uh, generated by a primitive, primitive nth root of unity, which we could make it the fifth root of unity if we want to, uh, and that'll give rise to a Herzebrück uh, young singularity of this type. So this might even be useful. It might be another way to express um, any, any of the work, recent work with uh, Marcelo. He, you might be able to go back and forth between this language which is nice, but I'll explain it a little more. But, so this is, uh, this is the index three. A lot of people haven't studied these, so I, I, uh, this is coming from uh, more of mathematical literature. Okay, okay so mysterious duality. Uh, this is dealing more with the, the physical realization uh, of these del peso sur uh, surfaces and their blow-ups. Okay, so originally the mysterious duality is a correspondence between uh, Toroidal compactifications of M theory and uh, del peso surfaces. So M theory on a, a K torus, so it's you know some uh, K dimensional torus, corresponds to uh, the projected plane CP2 blown up at K generic points. So the more blowups you have, it looks like M theory compactified on um, some torus. You know, so, so it's like. T1, T2, T3, and uh, so this is going to go out as far as we can have the, the blow-ups. You, know, you, you saw that we can't keep blowing up all we want, right? It's restricted. So when we keep going, you know, it maxes out at E8. So uh, there's a correspondence there, That's, but it was mysterious, and it still kind of is mysterious, but we'll try to make it less mysterious in this talk. Uh, so... Uh, type 2b string theory, okay, they found, uh, so you saw, you remember the classification where I mentioned uh, the, the degree 8 with the Gorenstein del, del peso surfaces, you know, when it has a CP1 cross CP1, so there's two different types, there's one with the, the plane blown up at one point, or the CP1 cross CP1, so if you choose this degree 8 del peso surface, uh, that'll give you the type 2b string theory. So it's interesting. So you, you make a different choice and then you get a different string theory because they're, they're uh, you know, you have the type 2a, type 2b. Uh, so S duality, which is, uh, you know, a, a way to, it's a, it's a kind of a duality that arises um, in 10 dimensions. So it's realized as the exchange of these CP1s. So it's, kind of interesting. It's, it's really simple if you look at it in terms of these del peso surfaces. You can get something very deep by just doing something uh, very simple with these surfaces. Um, so if you take the other path and you take CP2 and you blow up one of the points, then instead it'll take you to type 2a string theory. Okay. So there, there's something deep going on here, right? Mike, in this yeah. case, uh, the S-duality has a less... Uh Explicit action in type 2 Yeah. Because you don't have any more the interchange of the two CPUs. Right, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't. Um, I mean, it's, it's less manifest, that's why. Yeah, yeah. It's always there, but uh, it's not so yeah, it's not automatically as, explicit. Yeah, the type 2B, it seems easier with right. with expressing it here. Yeah, I've seen that. I, I'm not sure how to do it for type 2A in terms of these surfaces yet. I've, so, Mike, you, yeah. so what you're saying is there's some sort of deep relationship between E8 and. T8 and 8 Taurus. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yep. So a friend of ours, Michael Baki, who wrote that, that Bible, or yeah. uh -huh. he has a paper that I thought was interesting about relating E8 to higher dimensional Tauri. Yep. Uh, I don't know. You, you know about it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. All right. And it's, it's good to, actually, it's a good time to go back to it with the Doors Project. Yeah. I, I think it's fitting in there. Um, 
everything's coming coming back, so it's good. Uh, okay, so we have uh, the moduli of compactifications of M theory. So when you have M theory reduced along these tori, okay, so it's coming from eleven dimensions reduced on a tori. Um, you could uh, map them to the del peso surfaces, okay? So you can um, map the moduli of it. Uh, so moduli space. So the u-duality group, okay? So this is um, a, a, a symmetry that arises. It's a certain global symmetry. Uh, they correspond to the classical symmetries of the del peso surfaces um, expressed in terms of global diffeomorphisms. So you, you can realize this deep duality also in terms of these surfaces. So definitely there's something going on. So this is, these are just hints that came up in this mysteri mysterious duality um, approach. And uh, there's also these states, these half BPS brain charges uh, of M theory, which correspond to these, these uh, curves or spheres in the del peso. And uh, their tension is uh, the exponentiated volume of the corresponding spheres. So these charges also are seen in terms of curves in the del peso surfaces. And uh, it's definitely looking interesting. So uh, there was further studies um, to go beyond, you know, what mysterious duality arose, but is there something deeper going on? So Julia and, um, and colleagues... Uh, followed that trail and uh, studied uh, enlarged um, duality superalgebras, okay, um, that, that exhibit this, this U duality and uh, came upon Borchardt's superalgebras. So, you know, we've been discussing the Borchardt's algebras, and these end up showing up when, when you kind of carry it to its log logical conclusion, right? But it's not concluded yet, but it's, you follow that, that, that pathway. So, uh, you can truncate it. So there's these, these Borchardt superalgebras that are truncated by choice of uh, Grassmann coefficients. So that was a further study that was done. So uh, this is a, a paper that, that Ray, Ray had sent out in, a, in an email. This is a good one. I think it originally, Carlos. I think Carlos had sent it to Ray and then, so uh, it came in a few inboxes there. So the full Borchardt's root lattices are related to the second integral cohomology of the del pezzo surf surface. So that's kind of the conclusion there, which is nice. Okay, so now we go on to uh, super gang mills and uh, exceptional periodicity, try to relate everything back again. And we'll go beyond those studies. So uh, Sesgin and colleagues, uh, envisioned a unification of type 2a and type 2b uh, strings in a framework beyond 11 dimensions. So they ventured to go beyond. Uh, you could do it different ways. Uh, commonly, it was, it's thought, you know, it was impossible to go beyond 10-1, 11 dimensions, right? There's certain reasons. And, uh, but there were a few assumptions made as well. So Lorentzian signature was assumed. And uh, also the, the requirement that no spin higher than two. Okay. So there's kind of a loophole, right? You can not use Lorentzian signature if you add more time, degrees of freedom. So that's what was done here. Um, you had an analysis done by Duff, Blanco, 1988. Um, that studied a non-Lorentzian signature, right? So in 10-2, you have a... 2-2 uh, two, two brain. So it's a 2 brain that can explore two time directions. So this goes back to the 80s. And so if you follow that path and you take it even higher, right? 10-2, let's, let's add in a space, add in a time direction, and we can get to 11-3. And uh, Sesgin uh, and his colleagues showed that you can uh, go up to a, a, a super algebra an n equals one superalgebra in this signature and unite type 2a and type 2b because normally they're these are different different frameworks and you can unify them in this signature so this, this was a nice result but the three time components looks a little you know looks a little wild 
So what do we expect in 11.3 signature uh, Yang Mills? Well, we expect to have, by, by the super algebra, the way it was written out, you see, um, we have uh, the, you know, uh, the central charge here that has uh, seven components. So this would be for a seven brain and it's dual, a three brain. So we have a three brain and a seven brain. And this is exactly what we see in F theory. F theory, we do see this in a lot of the successful models recently. Uh, are exploring intersections of various seven brains. And, and this is also related to the del peso surfaces and the K3 surfaces. So definitely there's a relation, you know, you can approach it different ways. And, uh, but you can see here how it's very natural in this three time signature. This kind of uh, maxes out uh, F theory. And there's, there's another theory by Bars called S theory for sire. So father, sire, and you could think we go to 11.3 and there would be some ancestral theory. It's a, is this massive brains? Massive brains? Uh, I don't, yeah, look like massive. I don't think, I think they're mass, that's right, yeah, yeah I think. Massive. Yeah, because the massive, they come up with the, yeah, diff, there's a different way, yeah. So I think these are massless, yes. Okay, so, how much more intense? Marani? Marani is actually, <laughs> in the audience right now. I uh, don't want to embarrass him, so we won't point him out, but some of you know who he is. <laughs> you, may, you might have seen him around uh, getting some coffee. Okay, so uh, Marani and... Uh, well, actually, and you and David. Yeah, and David and I. Yes. You know, but his name just looks cool, so I put it there, and I'll be the, I'll be the et al. No, no, you're the et. David. Yeah, and he's all. He's all. Yeah. The end all. <laughs> the end all. Of, yeah. Well, the final yeah. word, David. There you go. So, uh, what was shown is that that eleven three. Okay, you could, you could actually extend the whole family of uh, multi, you know, multi time signatures. So we can have single time, um, two time, three time, four time, and you can have this this periodic series of families of higher superalgebras that, that uh, would just um, naturally come from that construction in 11.3, you know, if you follow the, the patterns given by Sezgin and uh, Nishino, Bars, and uh, Duff. So here um, you can see uh, if we just have n, n0 and being zero, right? We have the first level. We have a five brain, six brain. Seven brain, eight brain, you know, and then you have the next level and so you'd upgrade it. So one is so you have a nine brain, you're right, and then you have a 10, 11 brain, and 12 brain. So this, that's how you read off the, the brain structure from these things. So these are nice. The super algebras explore, uh, they give you information about, you know, the structure of a, of a theory without really getting too deep into the theory. It gives you this, this, um, you know, uh, information of, about the theory in a nice, compact way, and it tells you what kinds of... Uh, it's interesting that when you have more than one time, there's no momentum in your anti-curmutators. Yeah, so, so very we can... Uh, yeah. That's why uh, <laughs> the people don't like it, because uh, it's not really... Uh, it doesn't have a super Poincaré limit. That's the point. That's right. Because that's right. it doesn't have the momentum generator. But uh, as a super algebra, they were defined. So you can define these theories which are uh, which doesn't have a non-trivial Poincaré limit, super Poincaré limit. Yes. Yeah, and for this case, why is it because you really a, have an extra? You have extra time. So that's probably why. There, there'd be an ambiguity there. <laughs> there's an ambiguity, so you have to. Uh, there's been a suggestion uh, to map one of the the central charges. You map it to the P. So. In the two time, at least, there was a mapping between uh, the, the two component central charge here. So there's been some suggestions I, I can show you uh, after, after the talk. OK. So uh, yeah, so this kind of gives you a roadmap. It gives the existence of some higher super Yang Mills theories that haven't really been conceived of before uh, that are of this this periodic nature where it, it maxes out at four and then it, you have another, another um, family that goes up to four time directions and uh, you can have some interesting results there. So 
for this family in particular, so the 11 plus 8n with three times, uh, if you study it just at, at this level here, right, where you zero this part out, uh, there's been those results where you have the 11-3 superalgebra reducing to the type 2a and type 2b. So if you conti continue this uh, periodic series up, you know, to higher levels, then it should imply that there would be some generalized type 2a and type 2b. You know, it, it's kind of like, it's, it's like it's probing uh, higher versions of M theory and, and higher signatures, maybe uh, 18-1. Um, you know, so you can have these interesting signatures, 17-1, 18-1. And uh, so it's, it suggests that, that's what these, um, these theories suggest, that there's, there's some kind of periodic structure to that. Okay, so, and they also admit higher, higher dimensional generalizations of the electric and magnetic brains here, which would be the three and seven brains. Okay, and um, what's nice is when you study these, it's the, if you look at the dimension of this magnetic brain and you, you figure out or you compute its cohomology, which would be like the, the, the p-form fields over just that brain itself, um, you'll find that the degrees of freedom match uh, the spinner degrees of freedom that you'd expect in the theory. So it's almost suggesting that the, the spinorial degrees of freedom are coming from uh, some sort of uh, brain, brain world picture, which is interesting. But this is work in progress. This, this, I remember that you had the notion of Dirac color spinners, which is more connected with p-forms. Yes, uh, essentially it's, yeah. um, yeah. it's a projection, uh, uh, as far as I remember, it's a projection of a, um, a bilinear in the spinner. So it's, it's in some sense it's a bilinear in the spinners which gives rise to, I mean, to the gamma matrices. To it's a generalization of the usual uh, product of the spinners going to a vector. Yeah. The Dirac current. Right. Yeah. And it's important when you study the different group properties in the spinner bundle. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay so yeah. these these higher super Yang Mills theories, they can also be encoded in uh, extensions, uh, finite dimensional extensions of the exceptional Lie algebras, and uh, each of these algebras admit uh, a certain. Uh, star-like representation, which is the magic star of uh, exceptional periodicity. So this is a mathematical result, but it's, it, it's also very nice um, in describing the structure of these higher super Yang Mills theories. So uh, what replaces Jordan algebras here for the case of uh, E8, for instance, are T algebras that were studied originally by Vinberg. Okay. So Accordingly, uh, through the lens of exceptional periodicity, there should be some uh, types of generalized string and M theories uh, encoded by these uh, magic star algebras. So uh, for the next family after uh, E6, E7, E8, you know, the usual family that we know of, um, you'd have this family here. Okay, so we have the 17-1, 256, uh, 18 two, the 512, a 19-3 with the 1024 spinner, and then this is this is just a five grading of this thing. But these are no longer Lie algebras, so you sacrifice uh, the Lie algebra structure. The Jacobi uh, doesn't doesn't work here, but you do have uh, well-defined commutators, so you can have some kind of interactions. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, this signature is the same the same uh, signature that you find with the uh, second um, homology group of the K3 surface, okay? So it's, it's interesting. So if we study like a lattice version of this, there could be a direct relation to these, these K3 surfaces. So you can see that you could be going the way of Yang Mills and you also, you'll find a way back to these surfaces. Okay, so um, going here, let's study just this one here. This hints at a, a 22 dimensional theory. Right, so there's the 22 vector. Here's the spinner here, and these will be the rotation. This is a T algebra, really, that they're looking at, right? Yeah. So uh, this here, yeah, th this this acts directly on the T algebra, yeah. 
And you could think of these as acting on the whole, uh, the star, more of the star configuration. Oops. Right here, yeah. So the, you're acting on the whole structure. So whereas this one here would be just acting here across. So these are these are like the generalizations of what's called the Jordan pair. Yes. I forgot, uh, at the center of the star, you had the analog of G2, I forgot. This you is the, the analog of, of E6. 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 Yes. E6. Okay. It's yes. this G2 one, the whole thing. It's just the skeleton of that structure right. oh, okay. uh, without okay. any extension. Yeah, on the yeah. yeah. so this, this algebra here, yeah. the whole thing is in the middle, in which is the higher dimensional analog of E6. Okay. Yeah. With the, now you see it's 256, 256. It's pretty nice when you're studying, uh, especially uh, M-theory. It, it seems highly applicable because uh, we, we do see 256 uh, spinners arising. Yeah, this is also key for eight. You're right, yes. yeah. So it's hinting at a, a higher dimensional theory, for instance. Let's take it, let's we're, take this seriously as a theory. And what it, what it gives you is a magnetic 11 brain. Okay, and the cohomology of that gives you the 1024 and the 1024. Okay, so you could look at it different ways. You could look at the algebra um, here, or you can just say, well, I know about the 11 brain in it, and I'm looking at the, the p-forms over this brain, and then you can just recover the 1024 there. So these degrees of freedom, as uh, Cinziana said, is, these are pretty nice, uh, favorable for dark matter. It's a oh, sweet also. spot, sweet spot as far as the degrees of freedom. Someone did some counting, right? There's I a, we were yeah. talking about the other day, because yeah. I never had the chance to ask Sinsana, what you mean by spinella degrees of freedom? I guess I talked about this. You talk, you talk about the degrees of freedom associated, associated with the internal symmetry group in the internal space? Yeah, it's basically the total number of degrees of freedom as decoupling for fermions. Oh, okay. So that's, that's what I'm referring to. So um, fermions who give, to answer Ahmed's uh, question, yes. um, fermions who give the type of predictions at the level of galaxies and galaxy formations that we need yes. are having the velocity that can be traced back to a mass that if you look at the models for um, um, formation of particles, for how they decouple yes. and how they uh, recover mass, um, ask for this type of degrees of freedom. So did that type of degrees of freedom give something to 2.3 ki kilo electron volts plus minus depending on which model you're looking at, which is very much in agreement with uh, structure formation, uh, structure evolution, and small scale structure. This 10 to, to 24, is that 2 to the 10? If I did it right, is that uh, 2 to the 11. 2 to the 11? Yeah. Uh, okay. 10 to 24 is 2 to the 10, so yeah. 1024 plus 1024 to 11. Yeah. yeah, to 11th, yeah. yeah. Exactly. So um, this 11 brain that we find, it, it will have its own world volume theory. And in three times, we'd expect to... 11 brain, 2 to the 11 sounds like a for another 11. But okay, I'm yeah, yeah, you're I right. I don't want to interrupt you. I'm sorry. Oh, no problem. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. the 11 brain itself, if we choose to just look at uh, the dynamics of the world volume for that 11 brain. Uh, it, it'll resemble this, uh, an, its own super Yang Mills theory, right? With the 11-3 signature. So within that, within 11-3, so within the world volume of this 11 brain, we can also study three and seven brains within, within it. But then, uh, so if we study the 3-3, the three, three, so we're just focusing on the world volume. Um, the world volume, uh, so we have a brain within a brain, okay? And the physics could look like, we, we could say, okay, well, we'll let's assign it the 3-3 three, three to space-time, right? We have three space, a uh, three time. And uh, this, is, this magnetic brain will, we can use for the, the compact dimensions, okay? So this will resemble um, a kind of a, a kaluza klein structure here. So this seven brain here, um, the, the cohomology over it will give us 64 and a 64. 
So this is the 64, uh, it gives you the 128. So this is something that um, has been used even in um, Garrett's model um, for Lee, Lee Group Cosmology. And uh, so if we look at the field equations here, okay, so let's say we have some field equations at 11.3. We can view it as uh, reducing to a couple gravity Yang-Mills theory with Yang-Mills fields, okay, as the components of 11.3 gravity. So it's almost like you, you get this coupled theory by considering just the brain structure within. You have three brains and seven brains, and uh, the brain world model seems enough. It seems enough to give you what you need right here, but it's really, it's kind of, it's mixing up your, uh, your gauge theory with the gravity here. So it's, it's almost like n none of them is really completely primary. You can ask, you know, what's, what's, what comes first, you know, the chicken or the egg or gravity or Yang Mills? It's, it just depends because we can keep probing out. So this is brain structure within a brain here. And then we know this brain has some fields uh, assigned to it, right? That we don't expect these these uh, p-form fields to be talking with what, what's going on inside. So, from the, it's a question of what what do the what, what does this look like if your life is within this brain, right? So does it look dark? That's the question. Does it look like dark matter? Is that is that why we can't have a direct interaction with dark matter, maybe it's outside of our, uh, our big brain that we live in, right? So in a sense, we, we could keep playing this trick. Um, we can have these brains within other brains in this higher theory, and it's like a Russian doll structure. Is, okay. is it a Russian or a Russ? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, that's, yeah. That's a nice name for a dark matter particle candidate. I mean. Yeah, a, a Russian. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Like a, like a particle itself. Right. Yeah. So yes. Uh, typo, but interesting. Yeah. It sounds kind of a, or Russ Cyan. Russ Cyan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was, I'm wondering about the, the notion when you have, you know, several times, yeah. you have this uh, close timeline curve, right? So you have problems with causality because you have this cross time like current on science. Um, but anyway, we'll talk about that later. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, yeah, CTCs, I mean, you, pe people are doing quantum computing with those now, so those might not be too bad. <laughs> okay, so we go back to enhanced gauge symmetries. Okay, so uh, some, very favorable symmetries, the SUN, uh, uh, SO2N. Okay, we, we have different ways of realizing these. Okay, so now we get back to uh, singularities. Okay, so we can have a K3 surface with uh, the AN type or the DN type singularity uh, where the membranes, so they're wrapped around two cycles. Okay, so they become massless. Um, when you when you bring them in, you, so you have brains that are stretched, you know, between brains, uh, and you bring them really close together uh, so that they're coincident, and so the the tension, right, it decreases to zero. So the tension gives you the mass, since the mass, I mean, the the tension's vanishing, so the mass vanishes too. So you have this massless picture. Okay, so this like this limit. So you're kind of squeezing all these brains together um, and you, you, you get this massless limit. Okay. Kodaira is the one who classified this singular, was it Kodaira? Yeah, I think, yeah, Kodaira, and yeah, and then... These elliptic vibrations, I remember. And then they, they have these, yeah, you have... The, and the, you have the Duval singularities as well, yeah, so it's, it's the same, same kind of picture. Yeah, yeah, right. because he works in surgery of knots. Yes, yes. surgery of knots, yeah. yeah. So Sen showed that the Cartan matrix, okay, for types of the AN or DN, uh, can be recovered from the intersection matrix of the brain configuration. So if you think of the brains as mappings, 
between sites, between nodes. It looks like a graph of some sort. And you write down the inter intersection matrix for it, and then you, you can actually recover a Cartan matrix. So you can look at either picture you want, which is very nice. The what? No, it's Ashotek. Asho. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Ashotek. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He won $3 Ashotek million said. dollars they gave him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, who refused to come to Princeton. He wanted to stay in India. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. Oh, he, yeah, he's, he's yes. very well known. Yes. He's of the same family as I'm like. Uh, Smith is a very common name <laughs> in India. Yeah, very common name. Like Smith. Oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. Okay, so how would we see this in terms of polytopes? Well, the polytopes, okay, so we know, we know about the well-known in, embedding SUN, right, into SO2N. And we can represent this as a relationship between the N orthoplex and the N minus 1 simplex. And you can see this in terms of coordinates as well. So you have plus or minus coordinates, permutations, you could pick the plus, the plus um, coordinates um, and then you'll reduce down to a simplex. So th this is another way to view this kinds of relationship. So if you don't want to think of brains, you don't want to think of, of uh, networks of brains and intersection theory, right? You can go back to these uh, polytopes, the anorthoplex and the, the simplex geometry, and you can... Um, Simplify it for yourself. So just then it comes down to a, a matter of a matter of, of, of taste of whatever your constructions um, will be. So uh, as far as the, the brains, usually we're working with uh, n coincident brains, so that they would be you bring them together so they're overlapping and you get this uh, in, enhanced symmetry, or you can have uh, Kaluza Klein monopoles. Okay, and so this will give you the the SUN or the SO2N symmetry, okay, and which we can also look in terms of these polytopes. And as well, many of these curves, of course, they're spheres, and you can say, well, these are qubit spaces. So you can think of, of them also in terms of qubit entanglement, okay? So it, de it depends what you're really working with. And the qubit entanglement uh, picture is very helpful when you're working with the tensor network approach for these spaces. Okay, so there's a way to map all, between all these, and this, this, it's needed depending on what you're computing. You know, if you need to compute the code rate, obviously, you'd be using uh, more of a tensor network um, configuration, and so these polytopes would come in handy when you're studying tilings. Okay, so what about going beyond? You know, E6, E7, E8, right? We go to E9, E10. So... Why can't we just uh, keep playing this game, right? We, like, why, why can't we just have a finite dimensional algebra and um, express everything in terms of intersections of these, sur these curves, these surfaces, right? Well, so it turns out that finite dimensional uh, Lie algebras, so they arise uh, from brain configurations that permit, remember when I told you that we, you, can, you can bring them arbitrarily close together, and so you can make them, uh, so the tension reduces to zero, and then you get this massless limit. And so it turns out when you make the transition to infinite dimensional algebras, uh, so you get into studying uh, Katz-Moody algebras, right? So we you go into affine, you know, um, hyperbolic Katz-Moody. What ends up happening uh, is instead of just having a, a, a configuration where that you can reduce down to this massless limit, you, you have some other configurations here. So you see these curves? These can't be squeezed together. These, these correspond to the imaginary roots. So you're squeezing everything in here down, which looks like this E8 singularity. But then you have these that linger, OK? And you can think of them as these extra imaginary roots here. Uh, so what happens there is, is you get actually uh, massive states, right? Because you, you can't shrink them down. So there, there's a certain tension there. So you have. Um, some massive states, and that's, that's why you get these um, infinite massive generators of these Katz-Moody algebras. So this is a geometric uh, way to 
explain the, the, the type of states that you get when you get to these higher algebras, which would be interesting, of course, for what Ray is working on. Uh, Ray, in studying uh, these higher cats moody, he, he will inevitably encounter these infinite sets of generators. Okay, but this is just a way to interpret it in this framework. When you talk about brain, in this case, you're talking about D brains, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's D brains because the yeah. D brains, the, uh, the coincidence of D brains, or you can have the the Kaluza Klein monopoles on the other end, and then you you have them uh, interact with the oriental fold, and then you get the SO two N. So you could get the UN over here with coincident brains, which you're used to the the UN. Um, you know, you bring them together, the more brains you stack, okay. the bigger UN symmetry you have. Yes. So for the SO2N, yeah, it's, this, it's a different construction where you use the, yeah, the, oriental the oriental fold, yeah. But then you can relate that to the orthoplex. The orthoplex gives you a nice geometric way to, to, to look at the or, uh, oriental fold. So, okay, but what if we, okay, instead of using the katz moody algebras, what if we stay finite dimensional, but we we lose the Jacobi, okay? So we say, okay, well, I don't have a Lie algebra anymore, but I do want to say, I mean, I do have a finite dimensional algebra with its own commutators. And uh, it's, so it, it doesn't, it, they're very, very close to Lie algebras, okay? But um, there's just a slight difference. And so that's the realm of uh, exceptional periodicity. So uh, if we'd give, which nobody has done yet, but if we'd, attempt to give a brain intersection interpretation, uh, these twos here, so these, these twos are corresponding to some self-intersections of, yeah. of, uh, of the surfaces, okay? And these minus ones are sort of an outgoing mapping of some surface, a brain. Uh, this is this a case. gram matrix, right? The yeah, this is a gram yeah, matrix, yeah. This is yeah. what I was telling, right? G right. is for gram. Yeah, the G is, so this is, this is what, what one can write down. And what you see here, we have an M plus one. So the M plus one, the question is, okay, well, if we want to give an intersection theory uh, interpretation for this, then all of a sudden, I mean, we lose the self-intersection property of, of having two. So what happens here? I mean, because N can, can keep going. It, it starts off uh, in the case of um, E8, for instance, it'll be one. Then it'll, it'll go to two, three, uh, the higher you go in levels in uh, EP. So, so N is your level in this case of, of your, of, EP, of your yeah, EP algebra, okay. Of, yeah, in, in the, yeah. Yeah, the, the, as far as the, the levels of EP, it's the family, it's like a family yeah, number. Yes, yes. So when this grows, it turns out if, if you give it a, a curve interpretation, what it'll do is it'll, it'll, it'll take you to a higher genus. So it takes you to a surface with more holes. So that's interesting because uh, this, of course, this is uh, very early, you know, in, in this kind of analysis. But of course, I was interested in giving it this kind of interpretation. So if we do say that this is giving you a surface with many holes, it's a, you know, a donut with many holes. The higher we go with N, it's, it keeps giving you more holes. Then, uh, then we can think, well, I can... Uh, this would be kind of very, very non-trivial surface. You have. This. Are you talking about a, a surface in terms of a Riemannian surface or a higher-dimensional object? No, it'd be a kind of a, a yeah. It would be a, like a Riemannian surface. Riemannian yeah. surface. Okay. Yeah, because we're we're working at the level of of just two-dimensional surfaces. Yeah, yeah you're so about, you're talking about genus. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it'd be a, a Riemannian surface. Like a like a two D surface. Yeah. If we give it that interpretation, um, then uh, yeah, we'd have just many holes there, which would be interesting. Um, it, it would be, give us kind of a different result, but this has to be checked. But this would be the, the naive way to, to probe it. Um, so here, and uh, oh no, I think it froze up. <laughs> it, uh, Yeah. Should go, yeah. Okay. So now if we think of in the infinite limit, we take n to infinity, right? That n index. Uh, then we can keep encoding uh, higher orthoplex and simplex symmetry. So we can look at it that way if, 
if one chooses to prefer to study those objects. Um, or if we're looking at surface intersection theory, we expect to look at higher genus uh, self inter uh, or surfaces. And uh, so that'd be so if we <laughs> so we follow it to you know infinite theory, right? And uh, this um, this kind of implies that uh, the quantum gravity theory, the full theory that that we should be chasing, is probably infinite dimensional. That would be what what would be at the the end of the yellow brick road. The Pink Floyd. By the way, that is the best Pink Floyd shirt you have in your collection of 35 <laughs> Pink Floyd uh, shirts. Yeah. That's the best one. This, yeah, this you, let it, you let it and go to infinity, right? Yeah. yeah. So that would be the, it, it, the infinite level would correspond to this here. That pier. Uh, in my El Nashi days, when I, I used to hang out with Muhammad El Nashi, you know, we play with the idea that, you know, we live in an infinite dimensional world. But if you take the average dimension, you get 4 plus the golden mean to the cube, 4, 2.36. Yeah, yeah, I was playing with, you know, you have hmm. an infinite dimensional world and you take the average dimension uh, by playing with uh, the um, gamma function, you get 4 point something as the average dimension. Hmm. So anyway, this is something that I could yeah. tell you later. Yeah, I could that's talk. It. That's it. unexpected. Kind of yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. Seems interesting. So four plus epsilon seems to be like an average dimension, from zero to infinity. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. The sweet uh, spot. Yeah. Right. Um, so. Okay. Okay. That's it. Yeah. <laughs>